Hello, everyone. I think uh, so. Uh, we're get ready to get started here. It's noon straight up. Um, I've got you all muted. Uh, welcome. Start with um, just uh, today's webinar is hosted by the Nevada Board of Professional Engineers and Land Surveyors. By attending today's webinar, licensees will fulfill the PDH requirement for one hour to review NRS and NAC chapter 625. My name is Derek. I'll be running the webinar today. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, uh, just there's a few things I wanna take care of just to let you know how the, we're gonna run this thing. Um, we're limited to the first 500 participants. So, uh, so we're gonna be, frantically trying to admit everybody that tries to get in uh, from here on out until we hit 500. Uh, for those who maybe drop off or get disconnected, we'll try to get you back in. If for some reason you're not able to get back in, um, I just wanna let you know, we'll make this webinar available in video YouTube format that you can watch uh, at any time after the presentation today. I'll try to have that ready by Friday uh, of this week and the link will be on our website. I'll give you instructions on how to get to that later on in the presentation. Um, one other thing, uh, we're gonna use the chat function to enter your questions if you have any. We'll get to a sec, to, later on in the presentation, we'll have a chance to do some Q&A, um, but use the chat function to answer your ask your questions rather than trying to ask them, it's it's unwieldy to try to manage 500 uh, people individually. So uh, use that. Um, I will also give you instructions on how to document your participation in this webinar and how to document the credit that you'll, the one hour PDH credit uh, towards the end of the presentation. Um, uh, with that, I think there's that's all of our housekeeping issues. Um, I'm going to turn it over to our presenter, Patty Mumola. Patty is a licensed civil engineer and the executive director of the Nevada Board of Professional Engineers and Land Surveyors. In addition to the day-to-day -day operations of the board, her duties include working with the board and the legislature to maintain and update the statutes and regulations that govern the practice of engineering and land surveying in Nevada, which is what today's webinar is about. With that, Patty. Thank you, Derek, and thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon for this one hour session on Nevada law. We'll be talking about regulation updates that the board has gone through over the last few years, and we'll touch a little bit on dis disciplinary trends. So what I want to do first is, is here's what I'm going to talk about today is we're going to talk about the regulation updates over the last three years and kind of a high level discussion about those. I'm not going to talk much about them. You've heard me talk about them before in more detail. If you have questions about them, I'm happy to answer any questions. Then I'm going to talk about the current regulation review that we've been undergoing. It's related to the PLS standards of practice. I'm going to touch on Governor Lombardo's executive orders, which seems to be a hot topic. Uh, if you've heard about them, you may have questions. And if you haven't, this will be the first time um, that you will, and you may have questions about them. And then we're gonna talk about disciplinary trends. Uh, we'll highlight the most common complaints. I am wanna then follow up and highlight some, some of our regulations that I'm still surprised after five, 10 years of these regulations being in place that I find surprised that people aren't aware of them. So I wanna talk about those. And then, um, as Derek said, as we have questions as we go, please feel free to type them in, in the ch chat, chat, chat box, and uh, we will address the questions at the end. And I'm sorry today, I'm feeling a bit under the weather, so just bear with me. If I, if I have a coughing fit, I'm going to have to jump up and maybe get off uh, the microphone and maybe have some water. So anyways, uh, let's go ahead and get started. So as I mentioned, review of regulations. Over the last three years or so, we've reviewed 37 regulations. That means we've gone through all the regulations and we've decided to touch 37 of them. Of those 37, we amended 32. We repealed or eliminated five of those and we added one. And, and really the what we were looking at when we went through this initial review is 
What do we need to do to clean up our regs? Um, what's outdated? What can we do to remove unnecessary barriers? How can we simplify the, the language and, and provide clarification? And we have done that. Those are, um, have been adopted. And we do, we have published a new uh, law book, Nevada law book, uh, with the updated statutes, which are different. Statutes are NRS. Regulations are Nevada Administrative Code, NAC, but the, the Nevada law book that's been updated has, has any updated laws as well as the regulations. And if you want a copy of that, that's free. You can just go to our website. There's a form you fill out so that we can mail it to you. Uh, but they are available and they are free. And we're happy to send one of those to you if you, if you would like one. <clears throat> so just briefly on those regulation categories that we cleaned up, there was a group that we did was housekeeping. Uh, the board no longer administers exams. Uh, there's a number of processes we no longer use for in the spirit of transparency. We just went through and cleaned that up uh, to provide clarity on the application and licensing process. Continuing education, we've talked about that a number of times. The board added specificity. They, they added uh, the requirement for one hour Nevada law, two hours of, of Nevada ethics, but they also added the ability to meet your continuing education uh, requirements by self-study. So they felt that balanced itself out. Code of conduct, uh, we removed outdated regulations related to code of conduct and uh, the language for the ones we retained, we, we modernized to reflect current practices. Stamping, signing, and submitting uh, documents, that's gone through a couple iterations of changes. It's now written in a manner that we believe is workable. It allows for electronic submittals and digital signatures. And then we updated a section on of the regulations on complaint investigations and disciplinary actions. It really is just a reflection of what we call the board's rules of practice. It's how we handle complaints that we receive, how we investigate them, how we take disciplinary action. Probably the biggest change within that section is advisory committees used to be on the public record, had to be done as a public meeting. We've rewritten that language. We worked with the Legislative Council Bureau now to use it as an investigative tool. So that if we're gonna have an advisory committee, it's done um, outside of a public meeting. Okay, so that was that batch of regulations. Now moving on to more review of regulations. And this is, as I mentioned, this is related to the um, professional land surveyors uh, standards of practice. The last time that was updated was in 1997. So as you can imagine, a lot has changed since 1997, and we thought it was time that we did a thorough review of that. And the board actually created a subcommittee of two of our board members, two of our land surveyor board members, as well as practicing professionals in northern and southern Nevada to review all of those regulations and uh, make recommendations. And what we have done so far is that working group has proposed to amend 14 or update 14 of those regulations. And they're proposing to repeal five of them. And three, they're proposing no changes. And the ones they're proposing no changes to are really related to um, definitions and those pretty much stand the test of time. However, those have now come to a screeching halt uh, because of the next item that I'm, I'm going to talk about. And that is Governor Lombardo's Executive Order 2223-003. And what the executive order um, states is that we're required to undergo a comprehensive review of regulations, which the good news in all of that is We've been doing that for, for a number of years now. So we're very familiar with what's in our regulations and we've cleaned up a lot. This provided us an opportunity to take another look and see what others that we needed to clean up. Because when we went through the first round of that, the first 37 that I mentioned, we really focused on the ones that we needed to address immediately because they, they uh, things had changed so much in the way we process applications and the way we, we license and, um, and the way, the way we do things here in the office that they absolutely needed to be cleaned up. And we didn't touch some of the 
the other ones that we thought we could live with. So this provided an opportunity to do some further cleanup. The executive order also requires uh, that we recommend that the board recommend at least 10 regulations for e removal or repeal. We had to recommend at least 10 regulations and we had to provide them in priority order. And then it also asked us to recommend any other regulation changes, regulation changes that would speed new workers to work in Nevada or um, <clears throat> was an unnecessary barrier that should be removed or that could clarify or simplify our regulatory language. Excuse me, just one moment. <laughs> Sorry about that. And, uh, and then as part of that process, we were to hold a um, public hearing to get stakeholder input on those recommended changes. And it also said no new regulations, and that means no changes to regulations as well until the order is rescinded, which is why we can't continue to move forward with uh, any of our proposed changes in the, in the PLS regulations, except for those five that we proposed to repeal. If you remember, I did say we were proposing to remove five. We did include that um, in our list to the governor, the 10 regulations for removal that we're going to we were recommending removing those five PLS regulations. Okay, and that report was due May 1st. And so that report has been written um, and submitted. And, you know, there was a couple of, at least one particular item that people may wanna ask about um, of importance to you all is, we are gonna be recommending eliminating our state-specific exam for professional engineers. That's when you apply to be licensed. Uh, if you're a fairly new licensee, you may, may remember this. If you're an older licensee, you, it, maybe it'll jog your memory. But during the licensing process, after you've been approved to be licensed, you're required to take a 24-question exam based uh, on Nevada statutes and Nevada regulations, chapter 625. Um, and you must pass that exam before you can be licensed. So we're recommending removal of that. We think we can meet, um, obtain our desired outcome that we do with the 24 questions in, in, other, in other ways. Um, and so we believe that that exam isn't necessary. We had originally also recommended, the board had recommended to eliminate the state specific exam for land surveyors. But because during the public process, there was a significant number of people that spoke in opposition to that, the board changed its position on that and is no longer rec recommending elimination of the state specific exam for land surveyors. Okay, so moving on to Governor Lombardo's executive order 223-004. That required that we submit a report by April 1st. <clears throat> also that report has been finalized and was submitted before that date. In that report, we were to detail all regulations that restrict entry into the profession. And it should be interesting to note that licensure in itself inherently restricts entry into the profession. profession. I mean, that's why you have licensure. It restricts those that can practice. <coughs> One moment, please. But that being said, it, that's, that's what provided us the opportunity to take a fresh look at our regulations and say, what else can we change, eliminate that, that might restrict entry into the profession? And, and that's where we came up with the um, state-specific exams. That's why the board considered those. But they also wanted to know all the details related to our licensing process. What were the fees? What are the costs? What exams? Are people required to take? And, and are there any other requirements? So they really want to take a look at our licensing process. And then they ask that we make recommended changes to expedite licensure for new workers. The governor really wants to speed new workers to work in Nevada. 
Okay. And, you know, like I said, those reports are done and into the governor's office. And, and before, before, we don't know what the governor's office is going to do with those. Um, we have gone through the public process, but the interesting thing is, is we made our recommended language changes. It didn't go through the Legislative Council Bureau. They always take our regulatory changes and rework the language to put it in appropriate Nevada legalese. That would still need to be done. But the governor could say, take this and make it so, or he could say, I want you to do X, Y, Z, or I only want you to do X. We really don't know what the governor's going to do with those. And um, this was a requirement for all licensing boards, not just ours. So all 54 title licensing boards had to provide these, these reports. And you can only imagine that's quite a bit of work for the governor's staff to review and go through. So it's going to take a little bit for them to get back to us on, on what action, if any, that they're going to take. And they could say, you know, you're good. We don't, you don't need to make any changes. So they could say, you know, make some of them or make all of them. We, we just don't know. We're just waiting to see. <laughs> but we are assuming that in, in whatever he decides, that it'll probably have to go through another pro public process, which provides you all as professionals, licensed professionals, the opportunity to uh, weigh in on those. <laughs> Sorry, one moment. Okay, so let's move on to and talk about disciplinary uh, action trends. <clears throat> so in the past five years or so, the board office averages <clears throat> 45 to 50 complaints, calls or emails per year. Of those complaints, sorry. <clears throat> Let's grab some water. I just need a minute. Oh. Hold one. Can you mute it, please? Yeah. We'll be right back. Hang on one second. Okay. okay. I apologize for that. I'm so it's, sorry. It's allergy season here in Northern Nevada and uh, it's everybody's suffering a little bit from, from the stuff that's coming off of trees and plants. So, okay. So as I was saying, there's uh, four, but we get about 45 to 50 complaints a year or inquiries about making a complaint. 15 of those turn into case files, actual complaints. And, and what happens is, is when we get the call, we try to discuss it with whoever's calling us. And we really try to resolve it at the lowest level. Sometimes it's just the engineers not talking to their client, which helps resolve a lot of issues. And if that engineer land surveyor gets a call from the board, it usually gets their attention. And we can usually get them to talk to their client. So we, we really try to resolve it before it gets into a formal complaint. Um, and then sometimes too, when we review that complaint, there's it's not within our purview. It doesn't. It's not a violation of Chapter Six Two Five, um, the statutes or the regulations. It might be uh, a legal issue, a, a civil matter, or a um, uh, criminal matter. And in some instances, we can take action in those. But but some like if it's a contractual issue, we try not to get into that. They they need to go somewhere else. Uh, we're not the legal system. Other than we do have the ability to resolve issues administratively. So and if we can absolutely help somebody resolve a complaint with using administrative law, we we absolutely do. And even in some civil cases, there are some issues that we can help resolve there too. But some matters just need to be court um, to be resolved. Um, and sometimes it's just a contractual issue, a disagreement, and they need, you know, a mediator or arbitration to help them resolve that. <clears throat> and out of those 15 complaints that become case files, we end up disciplining about five, about five a year. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the 
most common complaints and disciplinary that result in disciplinary action that we take. First is related in NRS 625565, which is unlawful use of a signature or stamp of a professional. So I was gonna give you an example of that one, just, just to make it clear, because when you read the law, it's like, okay, well, well, what, is, what does that really mean? So, sorry, I'm getting to my case file here. No, we'll let, we'll let them, we'll let you guys read it, um, <laughs> just so that we give Patty's <laughs> voice a, a rest. Um, you know, we'll just kind of go slow on these and, and let you read these for yourself. And again, these are available on our website. They, they're in the law book, so. You can look these up at any time on our website. Yep. Thanks, Dirk. Okay, so I have two examples for this one. And first, one one um, one was an electrical engineer whose client was the school district, and the school district provided that electrical engineer drawings from another electrical engineer on a on a couple of schools. So it was a couple sets of drawings. And the school district did that because, of course, they want their schools to be similar. So when they change to a new electrical engineer, they would like to have similar equipment. Well, what happened is that electrical engineer gave it to their drafter, and the drafter just copied and pasted uh, those into their drawings so that it got discovered because the contractor working on the job called up the prior electrical engineer and, and was asking questions because he believed it to be their design because it was their style of, of design. Well, the prior electrical engineer got to looking at those drawings and went, wait, somebody just plagiarized, just copied and pasted our stuff into this new school. And the school drawings that were provided to this new electrical engineer were, were for um, new, new schools. And this new engineer was working on uh, rehabilitation of a new, new school. So they were, you know, they were keeping some of the building and redoing. So, so really a lot of legwork needed to be done to determine what was existing, what was gonna be used and, and what was new. That new electrical engineer had even made references left the, you know, had actually just copied and pasted because he even kept the same references into the other schools. So the new design was nonsensical. <clears throat> so that resulted in that electrical engineer being disciplined for that work. So he stamped the work, but he didn't thoroughly review it to see any of this stuff before he applied his, his stamp. So, you know, what are you really doing as a professional engineer? You have an obligation to thoroughly review anything that you sign and stamp. The other example I have is of a land surveyor. There was a land surveyor that uh, I believe he hired a, a tech to work for him to do some side work because this tech actually worked for another firm as well. And the tech went out to collect some data with his equipment, survey data to do a boundary survey, as well as a topographic map and brought it to this PLS, this professional land surveyor and the land surveyor stamped it and sent it on to the client. Well, during the construction phase, the new land surveyor, engineering land surveying company went out to start to stake things and they went, wait a minute, the boundary map, boundary survey map is off six feet horizontally and almost six inches vertically. And it was very apparent that the professional land surveyor had stamped and signed the, those maps, <clears throat> that survey work without thoroughly reviewing that information. So of course he was disciplined for that. So the next common violation that results in disciplinary action is NAC, which is Nevada Administrative Code 6530, which is relations with employers and clients. I'll just let you read that real quick, and then I'll give you an example of that. Oh, 
Okay. And what I want to say about this too is we often see this violation in conjunction with um, not having a written contract. And that's one of the regulations that surprises me <clears throat> that people aren't still aren't aware of. I believe it's been since about, <coughs> excuse me, about 2010, where we've required in regulation that you have a written contract. And there's three or four things that are required uh, within that, a scope of work, a schedule, and cost. And then recently we added, a few years ago, three or four years ago, we added the requirement to disclose where you, whether you had professional liability insurance. So just remember that, that it's important to have a written contract uh, with your clients when you do your work. But here's an example of a case related to someone who, who violated uh, this uh, regulation. <clears throat> there was an engineer that was retained to design a car wash and the engineer was paid to do the work and kept telling his client that, yes, it's done. Yes, it's done. It was submitted to the agency. Turns out it was not done and never submitted to the agency. So the engineer was disciplined, had to pay administrative fund, investigative costs. He was placed on probation and he was also required to refund the client the full amount for that he was paid to do that work, which he never delivered. So the next um, common violation we see is NRS 625-520, which is unlawful practice of engineering. Um, so let me just have you take a read through that real quick. <clears throat> okay, so the example I have for this one is um, there was an engineer that was licensed, but he let his license lapse. And then he continued to perpetuate the lie that he was licensed for 10 years before he got caught. So what he was doing is even though his license was expired, he was, uh, he knew that and he was putting his expiration date as whatever the, you know, showing that his license was active. And he got caught by one of the clerical staff at his own office either looked him up or or did something or was tracking the renewals for the engineers in the office and realized that they hadn't done one for a while and caught on and gave him the ultimatum that you either report it to the board or we're going to report you to the board. And so he reported to the board. Um, and that's pretty willful. Um, you intentionally let it lapse. He would have been better off to contact the board right away after that first lapse and take his lumps for that, but instead he continued to perpetuate that lie for, for 10 years, which is five renewal cycles. Um, we actually had asked him for all of the, a list of all the projects he had done during that time. <clears throat> he had to go back to each of the entities, restamp and re-sign them after we reactivated his, his license. Uh, he had to pay an administrative fine his designs actually underwent a competency review because there is some concern from the agencies. Was he competent? Is that part of why he let his license lapse? Because obviously he wasn't doing his continuing education either. Um, and he was put on, uh, on probation, like I said. Okay, so the next one I wanna mention is this unlawful practice of engineering. So if you could just read that real quick. <clears throat> Okay, so my example of this one is we actually had a Arizona engineer was retained by a client to do several development projects in Nevada. The Arizona engineer had started the comedy licensure process Obviously, he's licensed in Arizona. It should be not a problem to get licensed in, in Nevada, and we license pretty quickly, so, so really not a big deal. 
but he never finished the process. Two times he was told what he, what he needed to do to finish. And that was just the 24 questions exam, as well as pay the prorated license fee. But he chose to not complete the process. So on the project, there was a contractual dispute that arose with a client and <clears throat> the client contacted the board, of course, to say, you know, look, this guy isn't even licensed mm. in Nevada and he wasn't. And I think the, con the client was trying to help their case because it became a legal matter to resolve the uh, contractual issues, excuse me. And, um, but we went ahead and moved forward with the investigation and we did end up disciplining uh, the, the engineer. He did complete the licensing process, um, but it but did result in, in disciplinary action for him. And I believe he was put on probation. He had administrative fine and um, had to pay investigative costs. Okay, so I want to highlight a few of those regulations that I mentioned that I'm surprised people are not aware of, even though they've been in, um, we've talked about them many, many times over the last few years. <clears throat> Decoupling. <clears throat> and I can understand why some people aren't aware of this. If, if you're not going through the licensing process, you wouldn't be aware. But it's kind of important for you that are licensed, that are mentoring younger professionals that are going to be going through the licensing process, that, no, that Nevada no longer requires you to wait four years to take the PE exam. It used to be you, you got your engineering degree. Somewhere before that, you, you took the fundamentals of engineering exam. You took your four, got your four years experience, and then you sat the PE exam. Now you can take the PE exam anytime after graduation that you believe you're ready. Okay. And the benefit to that is it really helps those people that have their career, their experience interrupted. So if you're, you know, if you're a young woman that's getting married and wants to start a family, or you're a person that, you know, is taking care of older family members for some reason and you have to stop work or work part time instead of having instead of having your career interrupted and then having to come back and finish those four years you could take your PE exam before that four years and then just wait till you came back to the workforce finish your four years and then apply for licensure and the board's intent there was to really try to encourage people to go down the licensure path to, to not put in to remove an unnecessary barrier for licensure and <clears throat> dr james who's participating in this webinar on the line today was instrumental in helping us track that data he did a statistical analysis in those pass rates and what his uh what the number showed when he statistically anal analyzed those was there's no statistical difference in pass rates between taking the exam at two years and taking it at four years. So really, I would encourage you all to encourage your young professionals to, to take the PE exam as soon as they think they are ready after graduation. And, you know, interestingly enough, I wanted to say this too, is Nevada was the first state to do that. Now we're up to about 20 states. And more states are working to change their statutes or their regulations to allow uh, early taking of the exams. And also recently, we did do the same thing for professional land surveyors. Um, they too can aren't don't have to have four years experience to sit the PLS exam. They can take the PLX exam when they think they're ready to take it. <coughs> <clears throat> I, I was talking to somebody just a few weeks ago about this one who was a uh, higher up at a um, international firm about comedy endorsement licensure and about how quickly Nevada does that. Uh, 
If you're licensed in your, another jurisdiction and you have an NCS record and you transmit it to us, we can license you. We typically license you the same day or the very next day that we get that NCS record. And that's done at a staff level. That's typically myself. If, we, if you're what we call a model law engineer or a model law land surveyor, that's if you have a four-year degree, you've taken the FE, you've taken the PE, and you have four years experience. That's a model law engineer. Model law land surveyor is a four-year land surveying degree. Um, the FS, the PS exams, and four years experience as a model law land surveyor. And if you've done that, I can approve your application for comedy or endorsement licensure. If what we call, if we, you're what we call a non-MLE, that means you might have a, a technology degree, an engineering technology degree, and not a four-year ABET accredited engineering degree. If you're a non-MLE, then it, it goes to myself and the board chair. And then if we agree, then we can license you. So still quick, a day or two. Previously, before just about four years ago, those used to all have to go to the board. And when that happened, and the board only met every other month. So it was at least 60 days. <coughs> Excuse me. So, but now we do it really quick. So kind of important to pass along. So if, if you work for a big company and you want to get someone outside of Nevada licensed, then they just need to go get an NCS record. And, and we use an NCS record in lieu of our own application. An NCS record is the same information um, that would be provided to us. But the beauty of having an NCS record is all the states accept an NCS record. So once you send your transcripts to NCS, you never have to send your transcripts again. Where in the past, you'd have to send them to Nevada, your official transcripts. Then you'd have to send them to Arizona. You have to send them to California. But if you do an NCS record, NCS records, NCS has your official transcripts and that's where they will live. So it makes, makes everybody's life so much easier if you get an NCS record. Uh, initial licensure. I'm trying to think what my thought was on that. Oh, what was you going to say? No, I was going to say. Oh. Okay. Uh, initial licensure, what I want to say about that is um, taking the exams early, getting an NCS record, and also back in the day when many of us got licensed, we went and sat the PE exam in April or October. Those were the only times you could take those uh, PE exams, and you took them in a room with a thousand of your closest friends. Um, now you, most of the exams, the common exams like civil, mechanical, um, you can take on demand all year round. They're computer based and they're, you can, you schedule it at a Pearson View test center. Um, so it really has changed the process for licensure because you can take the exam pretty much whenever you want. There are a few exams <clears throat> they only offer still once a year. Those are, those are the like uh, nuclear engineering, there are not very many people. They, they don't have enough to do what they call linear on the fly exams for those. So they can only offer them once a year. But the major exams are on demand all year long, uh, as well as the fundamentals of engineering, same thing, on demand all year long. Uh, international mobility, I, I do want to say, if you work for a big international firm, uh, if if a person is coming from one of those countries, one of those jurisdictions that licenses professional engineers like the UK, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and they're signatory, and those are signatory to the International Engineering Mobility Agreements, we can license them here just like any other engineer coming from a U.S. state. And really, we're working hard to make that a two-way street. Uh, I've been working hard with Canada to make sure that it, it goes back that way. And we're getting close. Um, Engineers Canada is getting close to having an uh, agreement with their provinces. Um, you just got to remember that Canadian provinces are no different than the states. What we do here in Nevada may not work in some other state, but Engineers Canada has been good about working with their provinces. So we, it should be a two-way sh street shortly with in international mobility. And I already know that Australia will 
we'll take our Nevada engineers as well as New Zealand and, and UK. So, and if you need assistance with that, just let me know and I'm happy to help you. <clears throat> and I do want to highlight this, this regulation. We did change, uh, change it, update it uh, so that if you're working on a international or a, um, yeah, international building code risk category four structure, you are now required to have a, a structural engineering license. So civils can't do that work. So you might wanna take a look at our regulation related to uh, limitations on structural engineering for civil engineers. Okay, and this isn't in our regulations, but I just wanted to highlight this is uh, board meetings now. With COVID, we really made the transition to, because we didn't want to miss a step um, in, in our board meetings and carrying out our board business. <clears throat> and we use Zoom, we, so the board met virtually. <clears throat> and we've carried that over ever since then that we allow people to observe our meetings virtually. So you can go to our website, nbbpls.org and look at board meetings. And you can see when our, our either committee meeting is or a board meeting, and there is a, um, a link there to attend that virtually. And you're welcome to do that at any time. A couple other things I want to highlight. First off is the electronic submittal digital signature guide. And one of the committees of the board is what we call our professional association liaison committee. And this issue was brought up by a couple participants at that meeting. Um, how do we handle electronic submittals and, and digital signatures? <clears throat> as well as the old regulation related to that really didn't work. It's, it's pretty much said the, it was a professional's responsibility to protect their document and it had to be securely locked, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that doesn't, didn't work, but we didn't, we were at a loss how to fix that. So the board created a, a working group to take a look at that. And what really helped us is Randall Rice, who at the time was with the city of Reno, he was, also with American Society of Civil Engineers. He, he said, you know, what we really need to do is probably war game it, which was a great idea. We had people virtually, we had people in the room and we worked on transmitting documents electronically that were um, signed and or sealed and digitally signed just to see what the issues were and what we needed to address. It became crystal clear why agencies were frustrated as well as professionals and also crystal clear what we needed to do to fix it. And out of that, we did the last regulation change. Uh, and, but we also wrote the best practices guide, which lives on our, our website. And it seems to have taken care of the issue. I will say that in the office here, that was some of the most calls that we got was questions about that particular issue from professionals and from agencies. But with the guide, we believe it's working as it should. And, and if you believe differently or are hearing different things, please feel free to reach out to us. If we need to update the guide or we need to do something different, please let us know. But our, we rarely get phone calls or emails about that issue anymore. It seems to be working well. And, and I think COVID really accelerated that because people... And, and this guide was out during COVID when lockdowns happened in 2020. And it really accelerated the learning curve and people figuring out how to make this work. The other item I wanna point out is quality of plan submittal um, best practices guide, which also now lives on our website. And that was another issue that boiled up from our um, Professional Association Liaison Committee, it came from the city of Henderson. And, you know, I think the agencies feel it's, or felt maybe, you know, we need to do something to address professionals. And, and the board looked at it as, do we need to fix our regs or do something with, different with our regs to address this issue? Do we, do we have a competency issue? What it was the real issues? 
Um, but it was interesting when we worked through it, there's issues on both sides. Agencies need to do some things differently. Professionals need to do things differently. And so the, the guide has best practices for both sides. Um, and we're hoping it'll be a useful tool. And, and really, City of Henderson led that effort. Uh, the board did say it is, you know, if they felt it was acceptable, it could live on our, our website and, and that's where it lives. And I want to point out we are on social media these days. Uh, you can find us today. You can, oh, really? We just did a post today, Derek tells me. So we're on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. What's the other one? That, that's, oh, YouTube. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so check us out. We have a few followers, maybe 100 or so. Oh, oh we got a few more. Okay. LinkedIn's <laughs> our most popular, but check us out on Instagram or Twitter. You'll, you'll find we post once a month, maybe twice a month. And sometimes it's interesting, useful information. Sometimes it's just fun facts. So anyways, I encourage you to find us. You, if you just search for N-V-B-P-E-L-S, N-V-B-P-E-L-S, you'll be able to find us. So follow us, please. You want to talk about this? So, yeah, I'll talk about this. Um, this now, I, I, I sort of hesitated to, to give you the explanation at the beginning of the presentation. Um, I get I get so many calls about this certificate issue. A lot of you live in other states. A lot of other states require uh, different things to document your PDH activity or continue CEUs um, than, than Nevada does. The way Nevada does it is uh, we don't require you to provide proof, a certificate per se, uh, to get to renew your license. Some other states do. So what I want to make sure that I really, really drive home to all of you is that however you document your participation in this webinar um, is totally up to you. If you want to simply just put a note in um, on a piece of paper and keep it in a file, that's good. If you want to take a, a screen capture of the certificate and keep that, that's good. If you want to do it electronically in a spreadsheet, that's fine. That's totally up to you. It's important that you document your participation, but that's up to you how you do it. Yeah. So I do want to say this as a caveat. If you do happen to get audited by us, we may ask you for a certificate of completion or some proof that you did attend. So think about right. that. Right. But for renewals, Derek's absolutely right. For renewals, we don't need that. We just, you need to be keeping track of that yourself. However, what we've done, because I know a lot of people, even, even though I give this speech uh, frequently, a lot of you still like to have a, a certificate of some sort. So I'm putting it up here and allowing you, uh, one way to do it is just hit print screen on your computer and print this screen. You, if you're on a Mac, you can, uh, you can, there's a different way to do it. You can do command, um, command shift three, I think is what it is. Um, anyway, you can take a screen grab of this and uh, save it electronically. Uh, alternatively, you can also email me uh, directly and, and I will send you a JPEG or PDF of the certificate and then you can you can do it that way too. So I think the next screen actually has my email on it. Uh, so, well, actually, no, what it, what it has is the, um, this webinar as well as tomorrow's webinar um, on ethics that Steve Heiner uh, is going to present, and he reminded me to remind all of you that that webinar is is going to be tomorrow at 11:30 a.m. to 1:30 p.m. It's a two-hour webinar. Um, that's that's West Coast time. Um, uh, anyway, th those vi both of these webinars will be available on our website as YouTube videos, and this is on the continuing education page, and I've got the link right there at the top. Um, you can find the links to those YouTube videos and. Give me a couple of days to get those posted, uh, like by Friday. Um, and then as far as my web, my uh, email, is it on the next page? No. It's not? No. Nope. Right. But you can give it to them. Yes, we can. All right. So my email is, is very simple. It's just my first initial, last name. So D like Delta, V like Victor, O-G-E-L, at 
B-O-E, Bravo, Oscar Echo, dot state, dot N-V, dot U-S. And I apologize. I thought I had that in the instructions somewhere, but maybe yeah. I... Anyway, uh, dvogel at boe.state.nv.us. Um, uh, shoot me your questions. Uh, I can send you the, the certificate if, uh, if you would like. Um, so that concludes the presentation. Uh, we, can, we have time to go through a few questions. Um, I've got a couple here that I see that are really more comments. Uh, David Krenjak, um was commenting when we were talking about the comedy licensure. Wisconsin pre, and he's got it in the chat. So if feel free to read along. Yeah, and I want to just you can read his question, but I just want to say this to to David and the others too. Is um, in the beginning, I think there were a few states that said no, we're gonna not going to do that. We're going to make you reset the exam, which was totally ridiculous. Uh, in fact, Ohio was one of those. And I said to Hawaii's executive director at a meeting, I said, so are you telling me that everyone you licensed from California that took the exam early, you're making them retake the exam? And he was dumbstruck and he said, uh, no. And so since then, all the states have changed their attitude. We, they've been asked a number of times, no state is making anybody retake the exam now that took it early. That's just silly. And, and all the states, almost all the states are pursuing uh, allowing early taking of the exam. So, yeah. uh, the next one is is a Cana uh, Canadian question. I think it's uh, related to uh, I, with the um, uh, APEC Mobility Register. Looks like uh, yeah, and I I know we've talked to to this person uh, before about your situation. I know Marie spoke to you about it. And you're you're in your situation. You're better off to go ahead and sit the U.S. exams because you will get licensed faster than you would in Canada. Because in, to to be put on an international register, you have to have seven years experience. So that really only works for um, those of you that have been licensed for more than seven years. So yeah, unfortunately, and, and it won't hurt you any to go through the U.S. process. It'll actually make it easier for you to get licensed. Um, in the other states once you have that NCS record. But it will help you. You should have ease getting back to Canada, not have to go through their licensing process. You should be able to get there by comedy. <clears throat> and I'd be happy to talk to you about that too at some point. But I would for you, you need to go ahead and go through the US process because it'll be faster for you to get licensed that way. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we do get a fair amount of Canadian applicants that that call i think if the word has gotten out that there's a pathway to come to the united states i think the one thing that would if if anybody is canadian on the call um one thing to that's important is that that is not necessarily a pathway to come to nevada to then get licensed in texas or utah or california or any other state each state has their is going to have their own rules as far as canadian uh applicants so um Okay, and then uh, let me see here. I put my my email in the chat. I misspelled the the last part, but it it's up there. So the next one is reiterate uh, limitations for civil engineers. That is in NAC six two five old one. It's two sixty NAC six two five two sixty. So you can look that up. Okay. The next question seems seems like the requirement for professional liability insurance is a cost to practice. Perhaps a statement in a contract that you do not have insurance is an alternate. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's just as long as you disclose it somehow. You're not required to have it. You just have to disclose to your client where whether you carry it. And maybe even if you do have it, whether you're going to, whether it's available for that particular project. Because in some instances, it doesn't make sense for the... Um, to provide it on small projects. Right. It seems counterintuitive that we would require disclosure, but not require the uh, actual carrying of the insurance. But um, I think that was probably for that reason. Um, yes. And Corey's question next is, yeah, I'm sorry, Corey, I misspoke. It's not Nevada ethics, but any ethics. You just have to have two hours of ethics. So it's one hour of Nevada law. <clears throat> and the reason we did it is because we do change them periodically. It's important to look 
and be familiar with what's in there. So that's why we do one hour Nevada law. So you can go to our website, you can look, you can the online law library, you can look at chapter 625 NRS or NAC, do it yourself, or you could sit in on one of these webinars. And as for ethics, yes, it's any ethics, two hours worth of ethics trainings. And I, I get this question a fair amount too. Mm -hmm. Well, I such and such state has one hour of ethics and I and my we require two hours. So you can get one hour in two different states and that would still qualify as the two hours required in Nevada. Yep. So okay. Post although if you if you attend Steve's presentation tomorrow, you'll get two hours just like that. Yep. And then uh Post-COVID, are we at 30 P? Yes, you are at 30 PDHs for a two-year renewal cycle. So yes, 30 PDHs. Either NAC or NRS defines you can only practice engineering in a discipline in which you are licensed. I have heard rumor of both architects and engineers, non-electrical completing, competing, completing electrical load calcs based on NAC NRS was assuming that was not allowed. Is that correct? I would say only electrical engineers should be able to do electrical load calcs. Yeah. I don't know what architects do. It seems like architects can do just about anything. So hopefully there's no architects on the line. I don't understand that. I don't know how you can be an architect that does artsy designs on buildings, but yeah, you can do everything more than engineers can do. So I don't understand that, but anyways, it, um, if there's a specific instance that you're aware of, you know, you can call us and let us know. But yes, we are discipline specific state in Nevada. You need to stay within your discipline. And yes, electrical load calc should only be done by electrical engineers. So what kind of documentation should we have available for self-study? Uh, that's from Ryan. Ryan, you can, uh, you uh, Brian. again, Brian. oh, Brian. <laughs> Yeah, you can you can document uh, self study in any. You can take a screen grab if it's an article, case study, white paper. Uh, if you want to document it that way, you can simply write down a description of what it was, the subject, how long you spent. Um, you know, uh, one one good example of of how we request that information on our website. Uh, you can we have a PDH activity report uh, that if you're audited or if you reinstate your license. That's the form that we require you fill out. And that's a, that'll give you a good idea of what. But for me, as, as a professional, if I'm documenting that, I would take a screenshot of it. Or like if I read a book, I'd take a picture of it and just put it in my electronic file of supporting documentation of what I did. Yeah. Okay. And going back to the civil structural engineer, somebody asked about that, the limitations. It's Again, it's NAC 625260. So you can Google that. Just Google NAC 625260. It's there. You can go on our website, uh, and again, we we try to make the the statutes yep, on our and regs easy on our website. Go under the statutes and regulations header on our website, and it's broken out by NRS and NAC six twenty five, uh, and all of those um, exactly what the legislature uh, produces, or you can search it that way. Okay, can those of us doing expert witness work count forensic CUs? Um. I would say not the work itself, but if you're doing research um, for the forensic part of it, yes, because you're advancing, furthering your knowledge in a specific subject. Think, We're pretty lenient on what you do for PDHs. It's up to you to decide what's best that's going to broaden your knowledge in uh, as far as your practice. I don't know. Is there a stipulation that if you're an expert witness, typically you're getting, getting paid with that? Would that discount the PDH? Because PDH is supposed to be. Yeah. If you're getting paid to do the research, no. But if you're having to do the research right. outside of getting paid as an expert witness, then yes. Uh, can I transfer my? Yes. Um, I would just keep. You don't need to transfer. it. I would just. NCES to track your, your CPCs, your continuing is a great way to go. So any of you that aren't aware of that, <clears throat> you should absolutely do that. It's a free thing that they have where you can track your continuing education. And if you were ever audited, you would just tell us 
your NCSID number and we would just go look at your, your stuff. So everything's already there. It makes it easy for you. So absolutely. So yeah, Ronald, thank you for that reminder. I actually was going to mention that anyway. Um, yes, uh, NCES, using your NCES record is a great way to, to keep track of your PDH activity or your CEUs, whatever acronym uh, you, you prefer. But that's a great way to keep track of it. So. Okay, well, that's it for questions. Thank that's you, everybody. It. Yeah, thank you for all participating. A reminder again, uh, attend Steve's webinar tomorrow. Uh, email me with any questions that you have afterwards. I'll the same thing with the certificate. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Where's my...